In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. We welcome you to our spiritual exercises program of St. Ignatius of Loyola. And as always, let's off our conversation with invoking the help of Mary, the angels, the saints, and let's invoke also the presence of our spiritual director. As we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let's invoke our spiritual director. Our spiritual director is known as the Counselor, the Consoler, the Finger of God, the love between the Father and the Holy Spirit, the rest of the soul, the interior master. These are names for, of course, the Holy Spirit. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to be with us as we sing. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, all afresh on us. Once again, Spirit of the Living God, all afresh on us. Spirit of the Living God, all afresh on us. Melt us, fill us, mold us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. O Lady Guadalupe, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Catherine of Siena, pray for us. Saint Ignatius Loyola, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we welcome you all to our, our spiritual exercise program. I'm happy to be with you as we work together, we pray together, we rejoice together, we struggle together to grow deeper in our love relationship with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the intercession of Saint Joseph and the angels and saints. My friends, these, these days are very beautiful days and uh, try to add this to your spiritual repertoire or spiritual ammunition to fight the good fight to run the good race so that you can live out Prince Mon Foundation. And Prince Mon Foundation, of course, is we're called, my friends, to praise God. We're called, my friends, to reverence God. We're called, my friends, to serve God. We're called, my friends, to save our souls. And an element that can really enrich your spiritual life is what is called the the doctrine of the communion of saints 
So over the past couple of days, we've been celebrating some beautiful saints. For example, yesterday, there's a whole panorama of saints that we're celebrating these, these few days. Yesterday, we celebrate the patron saint of our parish, St. Peter Chanel, who died as a missionary martyr in Futuna, in Oceania, in the Southern Pacific. And every one of these saints is a special jewel, pearl from God, and but they want to share with us. They want to share with us the graces that God gave to them. St. Peter Chanel wants to share with you the grace to be a martyr to die to sin. He wants to share with you the grace of being a missionary. As Fulton Sheen says, first come and then go. You're filling yourself with God right now. Through this conversation, we're preparing ourselves to go deeper in our prayer life, to be faithful to our holy hour. St. Louis de Montfort, it was his feast day yesterday. And he teaches us, my friends, and he wants to share with us. He wants to share with us basically this. He wants to share with us, as a great missionary also, like Peter Chanel, his great love of God through Mary. He's given us the consecration program, true devotion. And the essence of his consecration is that we believe that Mary is the daughter of God the Father. Mary is the mother of God the Son. Mary is this mystical spouse of the Holy Spirit. And if we want to get close to God, Mary is the quickest, the shortest, the easiest, the most secure path to arrive at the heart of Christ is through the heart of Mary. She's the shortcut. For that reason, John Paul II started off his pontificate in 1978, in October, the month of the Rosary, by dedicating his pontificate to the Blessed Virgin Mary with the title Totus Tuus Ego Sum. That's Latin, but it's taken from St. Louis to Montfort. Jesus, I am all yours through Mary. Yesterday, we celebrate St. John of Beretta Mola. This was a Milanese doctor, physician, surgeon, wife, mother, just a very beautiful woman that used all of her talents. But she ends her life by giving her life for her little baby in the womb. She had to make the decision. And she made the decision, if you have to decide between me and the child, let the child live. The child was born, and shortly after that, John Epperette died, giving her life for her little child, imitating Jesus, who gave his life for us on the cross. So to say, my, my contact our your program enrich your prayer life by invite the saints to pray for you to invite the saints to pray with you invite the saints to walk with you to invite the saints to encourage you to live out Prince Bond Foundation because the saints they're in heaven praising, worshiping, thanking God for all eternity, and we're, we're, we're heading in that direction. But they can give a lot of wind in our sails. They can encourage us. There are cheerleaders. There are older brothers and sisters. They have fought the good fight. They've run the good race. They've already received the crown of glory that God has given to them because of their faith to God until the end. And then one more. One more to the to the 
panorama of saints that we're honoring. And it's the saint that we celebrate today. Her name is St. Catherine of Siena. Ask St. Catherine of Siena to help you out. One, one of the notes of the life of Catherine of Siena is that she, she really prayed a lot. She only lived 33 years, the same age as Faustina, the same age as Jesus, only 33 years. But Catherine of Siena, all during her life, she was very fervent in her prayer life. Sometimes what is lacking in our life is we start to pray and we're kind of like, you know, when 4th of July, those um, sparklers, where they, they flare out and then they then they, they die. Sometimes that's, that's what happens in our spiritual life. We've got a lot of fervor, and then we we lose it. To set our hearts on fire. Jesus said, I've come to cast fire on the earth, and I'm not at peace until that fire being kindled. Three short notes on Catherine of Siena, and then we're going to enter into our topic. We're meditating upon the last things. St. Catherine of Siena was the 24th of 25 children. So it teaches us to go against the contraceptive mentality. There's an article years ago from the homiletic and pastoral view, basically in periodical of priests. The article said one of the reasons why there's a drought, a dearth in vocations, is because of the contraceptive mentality. In other words, God calls couples to marry and from their wealth of children they will pull out a couple of priests. I'm living with uh, with five priests. I'm one of nine, but I'm with a priest. It's one of 13, 12 boys and one girl. He's a priest, and he has another brother who's a priest in Argentina. See, what I'm pointing out to is we have to be open to life, to be generous with God, to trust that God will provide. God will when a beautiful church, Our Lady Help a Christian, was built in Turin, John Bosco was the basically the one that, that organized that. And when he was talking with the constructors, he said, here's, I want you to build a church. And okay, and they said, what about the money? He pulled out of his pocket about four pennies and says, here you go, start to build. And Our Lady of Christians will provide. And she did provide. And now it's one of the most beautiful churches you have in Italy. A Lady Help for Christians, under which is the body of John Bosco in Turin, Italy. See how the saints, they trust God. They trust God. We're sometimes I can trust. Catherine Sien also, my friends, she, um, she had this stigmata, but it was invisible because she didn't want other people to know about it. She suffered the wounds of Christ in her body. Padre Pio had the stigmata for 50 years visible. Then at the end of his life, when he died, it disappeared. Another thing in the life of Catherine Siena was that she loved the church. The church right now, my friends, is going through a difficult time. St. Catherine of Siena lived in the 1300s. She died in 1380 only 33 years of age. But she had the very difficult task of bringing the Pope who was in Avignon, southern France, bringing him back to his right place, which is Rome. After she finally did do that, shortly after that, the Pope died, then another Pope came, there was more problems. But Catherine of Siena loved Holy Mother Church. And Pope Paul VI, in 1970, with St. Teresa of Avila, proclaimed 
St. Catherine of Siena and Teresa of Avila, two doctors of the church, the first two women doctors of the church. So what Catherine of Siena can do is she can help you to go deeper in your prayer life and to be more fervent because she was fervent. She was fervent. One occasion she was praying and Jesus appeared to her and and, 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 and wanted to marry her mystically. It's a mystical marriage in which she, he said, Catherine, extend your finger. And Jesus put a ring on the finger of Catherine. That ring was invisible to everyone, but Catherine could always see it because Catherine was married to Christ and to the church. It's called the mystical marriage. In a certain sense, we're all called to marry, to be married to the church because the church is the mystical body of Christ. We love Christ. We love what Christ left us, his bride, the church. So my friends, I thought I would just start off this day on that very encouraging note. We would uh, remember the song, when the saints come marching in. <laughs> when the saints come marching in, you want the saints to come marching into your life, to pray, with you, to pray for you, to encourage you, and to give you example. And so the Catechism of the Catholic Church says the saints serve for these two primary reasons. They are power of intercession and the beautiful example that they left us. So there we have it. Okay, my friends, let's go back. Let's go back now to our, our topic. And our topic this week, this is the third week of my program, the 10-week program, is we're meditating upon the last things. I think you remember them, right? The last things, uh, yesterday I meditated upon judgment. He's meditating upon eschatology, the study of the last things. And you're meditating upon the reality of death, Judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory. And with that, you're meditating upon the reality of eternity. So I'll just show those again. Uh, one day, we're going to die. We know neither the day, nor the hour, nor the minute, nor the way we're going to die, but we're going to die. As Paul says, the wages of sin is death. We live once, and then that's it. We don't believe in reincarnation. Okay, what you, what you meditate upon yesterday was the reality of judgment. So while we're living, we're living in the time of God's mercy. Take advantage of God's mercy right now. There is what is called the particular judgment. As soon as you die, you're going to be judged by Jesus Christ. As you pray in the creed, he will come to judge the living and the dead. And you meditate upon Matthew chapter 5, in which the shepherd will separate the sheep from the goats. The goats on the left and the sheep on his right. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was naked. I was a foreigner. I was sick and in prison. Whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. And so there's a particular judgment as soon as you die, then there will be the general judgment at the end of the world, in which the bodies will be united to the souls. The saved will go to heaven with their glorified bodies, and the damned will go to hell, and their bodies will be tormented by the, the devil and the Death, judgment, heaven, hell, and purgatory with eternity. So eternity, my friend, take into account what eternity is. Eternity means forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and there's no end. 
So these meditations have to be enveloped in the reality of eternity. So without ado, today we're going to be talking about a very serious topic. And it's a topic that a lot of people don't like to talk about. They don't like to talk about. And they like certain things they like to dismiss. And it's the topic of hell. So today I'm going to be giving you hell. Okay. There are many Catholics that belong to what is called the Cafeteria Catholics. They're Catholics that are selective listeners. They become Cafeteria Catholics in which they pick and choose what they like. It's like many of your children. Your, many of your children are selective listeners. When you say to them, would you like to go to Chuck E. Cheese and Baskin Robbins? Oh, they hear that with both ears. Their ears become rabbit ears. But then when you say, could you please clean the bathroom, wash the dishes and take out the trash, apparently they, they become temporarily deaf. They, they don't hear those words. There are Catholics that are like that, that they listen to gleefully, fully and totally, when the church teaches on, on heaven and the Good Shepherd. And even the communion of saints that we're talking about. We listen to that gleefully, openly, and totally. But with respect to the topic of hell, we become tone deaf or we put potatoes or maybe even watermelons in our ears. We don't want to hear that. And my friends, we cannot be cafeteria Catholics. Many Catholics are cafeteria Catholics in which they pick and choose what they like. And they discard and they reject what they don't like. Pope Francis calls it the discard, the throw, throw away society. We can say many Catholics belong to the throw away society of discarding what they don't like. You can't do that. Many Catholics are moral relativists. Moral relativism in which they pick and choose what they like and they discard what they don't like. Yes. So, I like to mention in passing the danger of language that is not properly used. Then I'd like to go through biblical passages on hell and see what saints have said on this topic. Having been an English major in college, I know language pretty well and I'm a writer. And I'm keenly aware of one of the real pernicious, poisonous elements of language is you can concoct your own truths by engineering the language, by using stock phrases, by using cliches, by using pious platitudes, and also by utilizing what is called ambiguity. Now, what is ambiguity? Well, you say something and it lends itself to different interpretations. In other words, the opposite of ambiguity would be clarity and transparency. So here's one of the dangerous phrases you hear. 
Well, Father, God is love. God is kind. God is merciful. God is all forgiving. I can't see how an all loving, all merciful, all kind God could send anyone to hell. Have you ever heard that? Have you? I think you have. Maybe you used to say that. I hope you don't say it now. Because that phrase, it's uh, the epitome of ambiguity, theological jargon, so to speak. In the sense that really what is said is true, but it lends itself to misinterpretation. It's true that God is, God is kind. God is merciful. God is bountiful. God is loving Father. True. I'm not going to deny that. And I try to promote that as much as I can with divine mercy. But saying, I don't believe how a loving God could send anyone to hell. It's true. God really doesn't send anyone to hell in the sense that those who go to hell, they make that choice. But the ambiguity from that is, wait, if that's the case, well, no one's going to go to hell. And that's what the broad, wide interpretation of that theological phrase, which is so common since the 60s, has permeated a lot of catechetical teachings. It's called liberalism. So let's move into the reality of hell. Okay, hell is a... It's a teaching of the Catholic faith. And if you like, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is one of the most authentic sources of truth, has a long number on it. Rather, there are three numbers. And if you can just look at this, it's, I'll get as close as possible. And it's on the bottom. It's the topic of hell, and it's not number 1,033, 34, and 35. 1,033, 34, and 35. So if you like to supplement our topic, to have a very solid doctrinal catechetical foundation, 1,033. One zero three four and one zero three five. Those are the numbers, by the way, that talk about death, judgment, heaven, hell, and purgatory. So, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, those numbers give you a good catechetical foundation on the topic that I'm giving to you today. Okay. So, that being the case, giving you that catechetical foundation, I'd like to give you. What does Jesus say about this topic? Yes, what does Jesus say about the topic? Let's get it from the, the, the mouth and the heart and the teaching of the Savior. Jesus, who is the teacher. Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus who is the only way to God the Father. Jesus, who is the bridge between heaven and earth. Jesus, who is our loving Savior, our Redeemer. Jesus, who is everything for us. The very center of the exercise, my friends, is to get to know Christ, love him, follow him. That's the purpose of these exercises. He... He taught about heaven. And we mentioned this when we were meditating upon the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you also may be. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. Jesus talked about heaven. He says, don't be perturbed. Now, this may take you by surprise. It may even shock you. 
is that Jesus did talk about heaven. But he talked much more about the reality of hell. Yes, he did. And I'll prove it to you. You got a pad of paper, you might even jot down these biblical passages. But Jesus, in a very direct, clear, almost blunt passion, explains to us purgatory, sometimes directly, other by, me, by means of parables. So I'd like to give you some verses. Number one, Matthew chapter 25. And this passage is a good passage to meditate upon the, the last judgment, but also it's a passage that refers to the reality of death. And I'll quote this from memory. At the end, the shepherd will come and unite all the sheep and the goats. And he'll separate them. The goat on his left and the sheep on his right. And he'll say, I was hungry and you did not give me to eat. I was thirsty, you didn't give me to drink. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was a foreigner and you didn't welcome me. I was sick and I was in prison, and you failed to come to visit me. And he will say, out of my presence into the eternal fire prepared for the, for the devil and his angels. And he'll say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty and naked and a foreigner and in prison and sick and fail to tend to your needs? And he will say very clearly, whenever you fail to do that to the least of my brothers, then you fail to do that to me. And they will be cast out of the presence of God in the eternal fire with the fallen angels. That's pretty clear. Pretty darn clear. So what Jesus is saying is that you want to avoid hell, then you have to practice the greatest commandment. And the greatest of all commandments is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. As your neighbor as yourself. Here you have it, the double commandment, loving God with your all your heart, mind, soul, and strength going up, and loving your neighbor as yourself going out. So you have the vertical and the horizontal dimension of living out our faith. Second passage, Luke chapter 16, another parable. Jesus speaks about a rich man and a poor man. The poor man, his name is Lazarus. And the rich man is given the name Dives, which means the rich man. You probably know the par parable pretty well, but you see the rich man sitting down in, in his comfortable place. He's dressed in linen and he's eating every day as if it were Thanksgiving. Now outside his gate is this poor man named Lazarus. Lazarus is dressed up in rags. He's um, He's got wounds, cuts, and even the dogs, the mangy dogs of the street, they come up and they start to lick his wounds. And he longs to eat the crumbs that fall from the table of the rich man. Then the rich man dies. 
and Lazarus dies. At the death of both of them, the situation is radically changed in that after death, the, the rich man, Dives, is cast into the pool of fire and he's tormented by the flames. Whereas Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham, symbolic of heaven. How do you interpret that? Doesn't seem as if the rich, as if the rich man had done a lot of bad things. Doesn't say that he was a bank robber, he was a murderer. Why did the rich man end up in the fire of hell? Not for what he did do, but for what he failed to do. Yes. Not for what he did do, but for what he failed to do. When we go to Mass, we say the act of contrition. It's called the confidior. We say, forgive me because I've sin thought word deed and omission what does omission mean omission means not doing what we should be doing my friends allow this to challenge you probably we're oblivious or blind to the fact that many of the times when we commit a sin it's a sin of omission we're not doing what we should be doing. Not taking our children to Mass. Not taking our children to go to confession when we could. Never praying with our children. Delaying the baptism of our children. Putting off the confirmation of our children. Failing to correct a daughter that's improperly dressed. Failing to correct a son who's going out with bad company. Failing to maybe correct a husband that's drinking too much. I know it's hard. I'm not going to deny it. But often we sin because of omission, because of laziness, or we don't want to get into a fight. So let's ask ourselves as we examine our lives, do we have a little bit of this divies within us? Better to work and correct ourselves now than to go before the judgment seat of Christ, having been negligent, remiss, derelict of our duty as parents. Third biblical passage, John chapter 15. What is John chapter 15? It's part of the Last Supper discourse. Which Jesus gives us an analogy and he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. The vine that does not pr produce good fruit, those branches will be cut off, and they'll be cast into the fire. I've come that you have life, and life in abundance. What is this? cuff branches and casting them into the fire. Jesus wants you to be fruitful. When you die, Jesus is going to say, where are your children? When you die, Jesus is going to say, where are those that you helped to bring to heaven? Remember James chapter 5. James chapter 5, the last verse. We hear, Whoever brings a wandering soul, a wandering sheep, back to the fold, brings a sinner back, saves his own life, and he expiates a multitude of sins. Wow. Did you hear that? He brings back a wandering soul. 
brings back a sinner who's wandered from the path. He saves his own soul and expiates a multitude of sins. Salvation and less time in purgatory. The fourth biblical verse. Jesus says this. You've heard it said. Matthew chapter 5, part of the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said. You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you. Whoever looks lustfully at a woman has already committed adultery in his heart. I know these are, well, these are passages of Jesus. They're very, they're challenging, they're strong. And the exercises, my friends, helps us to bring us to the reality that we cannot dilute our Catholic faith. We cannot downplay. We cannot pick and choose. We cannot fall into cafeteria Catholicism. We can't be moral relativists. We have to accept the truth. And Jesus is the truth and the life. Accept the truth totally, not partially. And Jesus goes on to say, if your eye is an occasion of sin to you. Pluck it out. Better to enter into eternal life with one eye than to be cast into the hell fire with both, with both eyes. If your hand is an occasion of sin, cut it off. Better to enter into eternal life with one hand than to be cast into hell fire with both hands. If your foot is an occasion of sin to you, cut it off. Better to enter into heaven with one eye or one foot or one hand than to be cast in the hell fire where the fire is never extinguished and the worm dies not. Let me tell you a story in the life of Padre Pio related to hell and related to this biblical passage probably know that Padre Pio, I've got a statue of him here, Padre Pio was a great man of God, one of the most famous modern saints. And Padre Pio had mystical grace. One of the things that happened to Padre Pio was he was in the confessional once, and this uh, woman comes in, almost despairing. And this woman had a very beautiful daughter who dressed very modestly, thereby being an occasion of sin for many men, provoking men to sin by looking at her lustfully. Of course, it was a sin to the men, but the woman, this, this young woman was an occasion of sin to many men. So Padre was in the confessional, and the mother of this girl comes here. In Padre Pio, who was a prophecy, he could sometimes read minds, he could tell the sins of sinners that wouldn't tell them. Padre Pio said this, Lady, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that your daughter died. And she died in a fatal accident. But Padre Pio said this. I'm sorry even more. Because your daughter is in hell. And the reason why she's in hell is because you did not have courage to correct her in the way that she dressed. I know, my friends, that these are stories that are, they're, they're pretty strong. But I actually think that we have to be honest. We can't be living a lot. 
We can't be soft coding serious truths. We got to come to terms with the gospel, not a diluted gospel, not a partial gospel, not a gospel according to Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck, the gospel according to Jesus Christ, not a cotton candy gospel, but the gospel that comes from Jesus Christ. If we live the gospel, Jesus said, I've come to bring life and life in abundance. The Bible says, I've come to set free from what binds them, what is sin. These are biblical passages. These are biblical passages. And they're very strong biblical passages. Then one more, I'll just give you Revelation chapter 21, depicts hell in a very graphic way as a lake of fire, a lake of sulfur. So there we have biblical passages. I'd like to move now, biblical passage to a um, private revelation, but has been accepted by the church. And it's probably the most famous Marian apparitions over the past hundred and 103 years, we'll say. And we're talking about, we're talking about Our Lady of Fatima. Our Lady of Fatima appeared to, here's a little child's booklet, appeared to these three children, Jacinta Lucia. And here's a good modern version of the life of Jacinta, Laura Fatima. These were three shepherd children, Jacinta and Francisco, brother and sister, and Lucia de los Santos was their older cousin. So in 1916, the angel appeared to the three children. In the following year, starting in the month of May, May 13th, all the way up to October 13th, our Lady of Fatima appeared to these three children, and she actually appeared to them six times. May 13th, all the way up to October 13th, in which there was a great miracle of the sun. But let's uh, focus on our topic. Okay, the 13th of July... 1917, Our Lady appeared, but this time she opened up her hands. She really wanted the children as well as us to have a vision of our topic. It was a vision of hell. Don't forget, these are little children, shepherd children. They're, they're about eight, nine, 11. They're little children. Children that will be making their first communion. So a lady opens up her hands and they're able to see a very, very graphic vision of hell. Now, what did it look like? Probably the best way for you to conjure up a good image of this vision would be, you go to a, a lake or maybe a river or maybe even the ocean if you like. 
you cast your eyes and you see that water, but instead of water, it's fire. They saw a lake of fire. What else did they see? They, they saw that there were souls that were cast into that fire. The souls looked like they were transparent, somewhat like, uh, like a helium balloon that you maybe had. And it was a helium balloon kind of being blown by the wind. So these souls were being blown, transported without any balance or equilibrium in the fire. Some of these souls were transparent, kind of like my glasses. Others were bronze, kind of like a toasted marshmallow bronze. Others would be brown. Others were, were pitch black. Yes. They're pitch black. And how this could be interpreted would be the duration of those souls that had been there in purgatory. Those who just arrived, maybe we were there for a shorter time, were still transparent. Those who were there for time had early turned pitch black. And they were falling into this pit of fire. Now with their ears, the children could hear these cries of despair, horrific shrieks, shrill shrieks of despair crying out of these souls that were living in total despair. Another element to this was that they see also these, look like these animals, these very hideous, ugly animals that were present there. But some of these animals were actually transpiercing the souls. These were the souls of the damned souls that were in hell. So fire, souls, torture, the devils. It was actually Our Lady. Here's a picture of Our Lady Fatima. Our Lady, Our Lady, the Blessed Mother, that showed this vision to the children. You would think that Our Lady, our life, our sweetness, and our hope, She's very sweet, loving, kind, merciful, but Our Lady purposely showed these children a vision of hell. So those in modern catechesis say you should never ever talk about hell. That's going to cause a trauma. That's, uh, that's cafeteria Catholicism. That's diluted Catholicism. That's Catholicism in which we become selective listeners, selective readers, selective acceptors. We have to accept the fullness of our Catholic faith. Not partial, but the total. I know that this is a tough topic, but if we do meditate upon this topic, we will avoid this. And this will spur us on to be zealous in doing all we can to avoid the reality of hell and to help those we love to avoid this terrible place. Now, after this happened, these children were transformed. In other words, they were good kids. But they were sometimes negligent. Their parents said, you got to pray the rosary. So when they would have their lunch break, they'd say, well, mom and dad said we have to pray the rosary. So 
Lucia would say, well, let's say the rosary. And they'd go, Our Father, Hail Mary, 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 Our Father, Hail Mary, 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 Our Father. So they just whip through the first words in the Our Father and the Hail Mary. Then they go off and have their lunch and they play their games. So, you know, they weren't perfect. They're trying to sidestep prayer, as many children do. So after they had this vision of hell, these children, they were radically, I said they were radically, radically transformed. These are little children. These are little children, my friends, shepherd children. They didn't even know how to read and write. And Jacinta Francisco are going to die within two years, never having even learned how to read and write. Lucy's going to be a nun. But then afterward, this vision of hell was so powerful that it motivated these children to carry out heroic acts of virtue. And I've got a lot more, but if you just take this girl, Jacinta the, the Flower of Fatima, after the vision of hell, this little girl could not do too many sacrifices to save souls. When John Paul II beatified her, he said that she was a little victim soul. Francisco was a little mystic, but Jacinta was a little victim soul. What does a victim soul mean? It means someone like Padre Pio, like Catherine of Siena, like the little flower, like Josefa Menendez. There are victim souls that offer themselves to God, willing to accept whatever God sends in suffering for the salvation of souls. So what did Jacinta do? She offered up everything to save souls from the reality of hell. Everything. Lucia asked the Blessed Mother, what should we offer up? And Lady of Fatima said, everything. But especially Jacinta. I really love this little girl. What a powerful saint. And she was canonized by Pope Francis with her brother on May 13th, 2017, a hundred years after the first apparition in Fatima. Let me tell you just one or two stories of what she did. Okay, she was with Lucy and Francisco in the middle of the summer in Portugal. It was hot. It was humid. They were tired. They were really thirsty. They didn't bring any water jugs that we carry, water bottles today. They didn't have them back a hundred years ago. And they're really almost dying of thirst. And Lucy says, well, if you want, I'll go to a neighboring house. You know, knock on the door and for some water. So Lucy went in a very hot day. The lady gave Lucy a pitcher of cold water that she could share with her cousins, Jacinta and Francisco. So when she gets back to Jacinta and Francisco with the cold water, they're almost dying of thirst. Jacinta, she says, take that water and pour it into the ground. Why, Lucia? Because we can offer up our thirst. We can offer up our thirst for the conversion of sinners, the salvation of sinners. So they took the water 
and they poured it into the ground. And these three little children suffered thirst that afternoon. Why? Because they loved God. And they loved what God loved. What does God love? God loves the salvation of souls. So my friends, I know this is a tough topic. I know it is. Hell is a very difficult topic. Please, I beg you, do not skip this meditation. Have enough, enough courage, enough courage to meditate upon the reality of hell. And this, as St. John the Cross says, meditation on hell sparks within us charity and apostolic zeal to do all we can to save souls. May God bless all of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.